he, he said like when he was like a youth team boy he got the big metal skips with all the boots in mm. he said pros butt naked him like took all his gear off <laughs> banged him in the skip done it up <laughs> wheeled it into the middle of the fair unclipped it left it there then he's had to get out of it naked and bring the skip back <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah just I just knew I just knew it was horrible really horrible feeling I just knew it was over I sat on a pitch after <sighs> yeah tears yeah, coming and mm. it, uh, yeah drove home and yeah floated tears really like pulled my car over and was like it's, it's done yeah just never picked up on it really didn't see that he was struggling uh, played with him for a year effectively and then it weren't till after that I realised how what he was going through and he was gambling away within a day or two of him getting paid he's gone he's getting bailed out by his mum and dad no way. so ashamed to tell any of the lads um, sleeping in his car around the corner because he had to lose his place <laughs> uh, we're, everyone's eating I've like spat my food out I'm like fucking <laughs> screaming like laughing yeah. I'm like what the fuck are you doing jokes <laughs> and he come back in still didn't know it was a joke and he's like oh no I've got a uh, drop joint <laughs> We've been, we've been forcing intros for like 12 episodes now and I fuck oh, them up every single time. It's hard work, that stuff, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So uh, so I think after 12 goes... You've had enough of it. I've had enough, mate. I've had enough. Unless you want to do it. Do you want to do it? No. <laughs> no. Straight from the offset, I, was, I, I ain't got it in me, mate. Yeah. So I think uh, a, a little bit to your form, mate. We'll just pretty much just roll in. Yeah, cool, mate. And yeah. that's it. Yeah, yeah, happy. Just introduce him and let's yeah. go. So yeah, happy, mate. Good to go. Yeah, all good, yeah. All right, let's so... Uh, Gary Sawyer, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Thank you. Yeah, you're nice welcome. To be. Good. Thanks for coming on. Um, for those that don't know, you're a retired professional footballer, um, ex Plymouth Argyle captain. Yeah, it's horrible. I still can't really get around the the, uh, the ex part of it, but yeah, unfortunately retired. But I had a, I, I had some good years, so it was alright. Yeah, and and obviously your retirement, I think, sadly was as a result of injury, right? Yeah, result of a, a nasty injury, just a bit of a freak one, really. Gets just stood on the back of my ankle, and that was the end. Yeah. So, what did yeah. you do? So I ruptured my um, ruptured everything in my ankle, basically. So I had to have a full, yeah, full reconstruction on it. I think what they were saying, surgeon wise, is had it come at probably twenty one, having played a certain amount of games, potentially I might have got back from it. Mm. Having played five hundred games and being older, it was just I just I just knew it was done. Like I said, always felt like I'd get back, but it just the longer it went on, I sort of got to a point where it was getting better to a to a certain degree. I couldn't get couldn't get out of bed in the morning, couldn't get down the stairs. But I could get myself enough to start running. But then when I look back at videos when I was being filmed to see how I was getting on, I was just nowhere near it. Like couldn't couldn't put a lot of weight on it. What's it like now? It's all right now. Yeah, it's obviously a couple of years since doing it. Probably took a good year and a half to settle down. But I had one moment when I knew it was finished. I said we we had a training session, light training session. The boys had played the day before. They had another game coming up, so we trained on the pitch. And we did a little um, little bit of keep ball, little boxes in each corner of the ground. Nothing mm -hmm. too strenuous. I couldn't get near anyone. And we oh, did really? the, yeah, and the boys that sort of hadn't been playing, obviously me included with that, we did a couple little box to box, nothing strides, like something that I would do in my sleep. Like I was always good at that sort of side of it. And I just I just couldn't keep up with anyone. I was in so much pain running and I just I did the last run. Did them all because I just mentally I just knew I needed to do them all. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, just I just knew. I just knew it was horrible, really horrible feeling. I just knew it was over. I sat on a pitch after, um, yeah, tears yeah, coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, drove home and yeah, floods of tears. Really, like pulled my car over and was like, it's it's done. Yeah, it's mate. Finished. Yeah, it's pretty savage. I um I used to compete in martial arts at like an amateur level in my twenties mm -hmm. and retired from that due to injury. But that wasn't my like whole life. Yeah, and that put me in a dark spot, mate. So I can only imagine how. Yeah, a career-ending injury must feel. Yeah, certainly you never think, you just you think you're Superman, effectively, you think you're just going to carry on. And I was quite, I was fit, always kept myself fit. I was probably in the top three or four runners that we'd have in pre-season, even that pre-season before it happened. So I always kept myself in good nick, always worked hard. That was part of my game. So you just think like, do you know what, I'm all right. I don't, didn't carry too much weight when I was playing. I was quite lucky with my body shape. Yeah, and I, I just thought, do you know what, I'll, I'll keep doing it. I'll keep doing it until someone won't, Give me a contract effectively that was my like plan obviously the plan was to get to 35 i got to 35 brilliant then it was like well how many years can i drag out of this mm -hmm. and then the, the injury come basically just just before i was 36 so. mm. and was that in training or was it no nah, so it was a game yeah so um <laughs> it's a bit of a nightmare because obviously with covid happening yeah. and everything like that obviously 
I'll probably I'll probably got I'll probably had the longest four game red card ban in history of football because I got <laughs> I, I, I got sent off twice in four or five games come to the end but I got sent off and then um, sent off away at Bradford then we played two more games obviously because I've been sent off just before that I got a four game ban rather than a three game ban um, so I had to sit two of them out and then obviously COVID happened so the boys are going for their game I think they were playing on the Saturday then the Tuesday we had a game then I've been back fit for the, the, the next Saturday after that and um, yeah like it obviously got canned on the way to the game so the boys come back so I've like, only served two games in my band at this stage and then COVID happened. Then we were off, off, obviously at home for months. We kept ourselves going because we had to. We obviously thought the season was going to restart. Mm-hmm. Nothing happened with that. Obviously, then it got calm. We got promoted, which is brilliant. And then come back pre-season, obviously late on because the season started really late. And then it got to like, obviously starting the first game of the season because of the season, how it run with that. We had like QPR first game of the season, cup game, Norwich cup game Tuesday and then the season started on a Saturday so in my head I'm thinking with a gaffer and that as well Lowy at the time I was like this is it's brilliant I said because like really yeah. like the two cup games, cup games are just missing, yeah. yeah I'm going to miss them first two games this season done play the first league game and then the league got involved about it and they were like look we don't not not see the, the second game as being a proper game but because it was in the JPT or the Johnson's paint that, that thing or the Papa John's what is that it's yeah, called now um they took that one out. So they said, look, you can play in that game, but you can't play on Saturday on the QPR game and you can't play in the first league game. So we were like, well... How the fuck can they do that? Yeah, so they were like... It's a competitive you, game. So yeah, a competitive game. game. So yeah. they were like, you can play Tuesday night, but then you just can't play the Saturday before, Saturday after, then your band's gone after That's that. So we were enough. like, well, <laughs> all right, happy days. I need a game, pre-se- yeah. end of pre-season yeah. anyway. And then, yeah, 80th minute, injured and then played again. <laughs> That's it. Which that, is what, just, from that game? Yeah, from, from that, that game. That just game, literally first game, game of the game, season. First game of the season after COVID. Literally, like like I said, it was just such a... Like, Did you have a niggle or nothing, anything before? Nah, nothing at all. Nothing, Completely just bang, fine. Just, got just through suddenly. pre-season, yeah. Fit as I've been. Probably arguably one of the fittest yeah. I've been. Mm. Did really well through all the COVID stuff. So that, uh, kept myself going. When you get older and that, you have to work that bit harder as well. So always, always had that in me to do that. And then, yeah, come back. That game... I didn't know I was playing in it until sort of pretty much the day before because we thought that was my band. Yeah. Gaff was like, they've they've got involved. You can play in this one. I was like, all right, sound, I'll play. And then obviously I'll be pretty much out of my band and I've had a game. And yeah, like literally it, it was such a freak one. It was just like I was running back towards the goal. They flashed it across the front. Giza was running behind me. And then it was literally, I just sort of tried to shield him out as a ball went flying across. Yeah, Nothing there, he was curious. never going to tap it in. But he stood on my heel literally as my toes went into the ground mm. and as he stood in it I was going sort of this way and my ankle went the other way and on the footage of it it's like my, my ankle was completely flat on the floor my, my whole foot the other way and it just ruptured ruptured everything, everything I had in it yeah lucky enough I didn't I went straight to hospital after the game no break so obviously I'm like getting out of hospital this is a night game as well yeah obviously like I've been dropped at the, dropped at the hospital COVID's yeah. happened so mm. no one can come in with you <laughs> so I'm sat in there till like I got home at like four in the morning mm. in my kit still mm-hmm. I had to get a cab because like I sent the physio home I said look I, I don't need you to stand here holding me hand like I said it is what it is but I come out of there for then alright because like they were like we've it wasn't broken it. yeah they went no there's no break or nothing they were worried it was dislocated for one part of it but then they were like no nah, I think it's alright had no break, no nothing. So I come out of there thinking, got away on here. Mm. And then we go and get a scan on it because the next day I sort of, I bailed the physio in the morning. I was like, I don't know if it's meant to be doing this. I said, but my foot's like about four times the size it normally is. So like, <laughs> yeah, he went sent me a not. picture. I sent him a picture of it. And he was like, he come rushing straight around the house then right. with loads of stuff. Yeah. Like, I could help it. He said, you're going to have to just sit with your foot up for the whole day. Ice, ice the life out of it all day. Yeah, and not do nothing. And it just went like, just completely went. And then he was like, saying seriously wrong with this and then when they when they yeah scanned it and did all that it's everything gone yeah because that's the thing with x-rays and it? it looks at the bone but it won't show any any sort any sort of soft tissue yeah. stuff so ligaments tendons muscles it just doesn't show any of it nah and they, they were really good i said the geezer after obviously like they rushed off their feet hospital anyway but he was like there's no break so yeah. that's good but he said by the look of it there's there's something not right here because obviously at that stage it's fairly early so all the bleeding didn't come out fully Yeah. so it weren't as big when I was in that and they bang you in the boots straight away so you sort of know where you're at Do Plymouth Fargo only have any private healthcare for players? Or yeah it? so it comes through like it's called Premier League healthcare Right. Okay. so it's funded by that and you pay into it effectively so anything that you need it comes out of a sort of fund Would you so do that through Nuffield or would you uh, It used to be through Nuffield so I've had four ops in my career one of them I had done up here at Nuffield 
in Plymouth. The other one's all been sent to London. So this one I had, really fortunate in football. You get sent to the right people. Mm. I had the best, or the so-called best ankle specialist in the country. He works out of London. He works out of Bradford. So he's done Premier League player, like big, yeah, big, yeah. top, like top, top players, like England players, stuff like that. He's managed all them. So I, through this Premier League care, you get given the best care you can get. That's really good. So man. I knew that like, if he says it's done, it's done, fortunately, it's done. Yeah, like, yeah. That's obviously what happens, yeah. So do you know like the, the, the finer details of the injury, like what it was that went? Because obviously you've got your Achilles, which is a big structure. Yeah, Achilles yeah. didn't go because that's severe, yeah. isn't it? Like yeah. Achilles are real severe. It's basically all the all the tendons and all the everything. Yeah. Yeah, old ligaments and everything, old and round it. So they went on both sides effectively. Mm. Um, and just obviously they all got repaired yeah it was, there was there was one other way of doing it so I've been out for eight months at this stage so obviously my head's gone <laughs> starting to like get real pissed off of it it's not getting better and then I uh, went back up to see him and then they were like right we need to jab it so I went up and I had I think it was like four or six four or six injections mm-hmm. and they were like if this takes the pain away there's a chance we can do something else with this but if it don't take the pain away we, we don't know that there's one other real extreme way of doing it but we don't know your age if you're going to be able to do it so did the injections horrible nearly fainted <laughs> <It's> <laughs> horrible, horrible. Like, I don't no, I'm alright with the other stuff like the yeah. ops and all that like obviously you put out but like mm. watching someone inject your ankle <laughs> it's just horrible like it hurts and then like feeding around it with like this little needle and that and it's, oh, it's horrible hated it but that didn't obviously that didn't do nothing for it, it was still got up still same as it still was before it, yeah. so the only other way to do the injury was to flip my tendons from my foot and my ankle round I think it was so they were going to change the ones in my foot for the ones in my ankle and change both rounds because the other ones were that stressed in my ankle they were like you could put them in your foot and it wouldn't really matter mm-hmm. but I had 12 months injury on that at a time a time limit on it that was like a 12 month injury I'd already been out for 8 months I was just about to turn 36 yeah, and it was so like 18 months so you'll be 37 yeah that's what I mean it was like there was there was just no way back from it and not only that the worst bit about the whole thing was like I'm, obviously when he's saying it I'm thinking well at least there's a chance here and then he ended it with this is potentially he said I, I don't even know if this I don't even know if it'll work because you've got to allow the tendons to take to it yeah they shouldn't be in that area but it's just a way of he said basically wheeling you out to play for another year of football at my age 21 slightly different but at my age, I might have been doing that just to get back on a pitch for was your, a couple of games. Was your contract up at the end of that season? Yeah, my contract was up. So lucky was you didn't on. do it at the end of the season. Would yeah. they have still paid? Would that? Would would you still been covered? Because that's quite nah, a, quite not really. Yeah, yeah. not really. Like, as, yeah. So yeah. it's good that you done it at the start. Yeah, of the season, tried at the start, didn't... but then it sort of like, we didn't end up. I didn't end up sort of retiring or knowing I was retiring until probably a couple of months before the end of the season. Yeah. So like, but I'd had a year of I was injured all year. You get paid all year. So it was, yeah, it was obviously better to do it at the start than it at the end. But I imagine a lot of a lot of lower league footballers must get caught with that because a lot yeah, of a yeah. lot of lads they only have like year two year contracts. Yeah. So if they get injured towards the end of a season, it must screw lads up. Well, it's, it's, it's hard it like mentally them. for you, know? yeah. and you think like at, when you get to a certain age, people like the three year four year deals go out the window. And they start becoming one year deals and you've got to earn your right to get the next yeah. year. Like, mm. And that's just, it's just I, extensions, I, 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 isn't yeah, it? I quite liked it. Always back myself. Whoever they bring in, young, old, whatever, always back myself to play. I played a lot of games in my career, played the majority of the time. Obviously, injuries are injuries, and that is what it is. What, but what clubs did you play for? So I went to Exeter, which obviously, people don't, yeah, people don't <laughs> tend to like. Um, but if I'd not gone there, I wouldn't have come back and played at Plymouth. It was a bit right. of a bridging gap. They had got similar to what's just happened now. Mm-hmm. They'd been promoted to the championship while I was in the youth team. So trying to make the level from when I started, they were in effectively League Two. They got promoted two of the three years I was in the youth team. Right. And you've got to try and make the grade to then become a championship player rather than like a League Two player. Right. So okay. it, was, it yeah. was difficult. So they said, we'll give you, we see it, so we'll give you the deal. So give me a year contract, but we need you out on loan. So obviously went to Exeter with that. Um, come back, obviously Plymouth, and then went to Bristol City, went to Bristol Rovers, went to Leighton Orient, and then back to Plymouth. Nice. So you've, yeah, so yeah you covered a lot of the southwest of. Uh, yeah, I didn't go anywhere up north, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that, that just weren't for me, mate. I Do you like it down here? Do you like it down here? Yeah, always loved it down this way. Loved London. Obviously, I was born in London yeah. originally. Um, obviously, spent all my childhood and everything down this way, though. Yeah. Um, spent obviously a lot of time at Plymouth. Moved here. Week, how did how did you end up school. coming from London down to here then? Obviously, family. Yeah, family. So I was only sort of two, three years old. Oh, really? Happened. Yeah. So oh, I, I was born there. My brother was obviously born slightly before me. 
but my family used to holiday down in North Devon okay. and um, just got to a point where they just thought, you know what, for the kids now, we'll just, just move we'll up shop yeah, and we'll, nice. we'll leave, yeah. yeah still so got a bit of the accent, accent mate. mate. Yeah, still there a bit, but yeah. everyone moved down. So it was yeah, like, okay. obviously, my brother, my, all, all my family moved down, me nan and granddad moved down. Yeah. My uncles moved down. Yeah. Everyone just went, you know everyone. what? Everyone. Yeah, like everyone went, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Half our family went that way, the other half yeah. went up to Nottingham. So, but yeah, we, we all come down and then you'd be amazed how many London people are in Biddeford and stuff like that. Like loads of people tend to <laughs> really? shop, shop and come down. Yeah. <laughs> really so they just wanted a bit of a better life, I think. It was, London's a brutal place, isn't it? And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it definitely can be. Yeah. It was just for what you get up there, for what you get down here and to just wade it up. And I think obviously it had something to do with, not something to do with it, but oh, my granddad passed away. Uh, just before we, we moved back down effectively and uh, yeah just come down and had a different start so in, in your youth team did you play for Plymouth Argyle was yeah, that so picked I was, you up yeah so yeah. I, I, I come in when I was 13 which is considered quite late I was about to say yeah that is quite yeah, late quite some late. lads are in from like 8 in there, yeah eight, like I'm I playing with lads that were in from really early yeah. and obviously nowadays like when you, you read this about kids at like 6, 7 years old they're yeah. going to these academies which is great Yeah, but it becomes like I went from playing in a park with my mates a bit of a blues I was at up till 13 years old which was like great good laugh like brilliant I like, loved it no real pressure on you but like you wanted I was at an age and I wanted to kick on wanted to do better I was seeing mates go to Plymouth I was seeing people go to Exeter and I wanted that and I felt like I was good enough to do that but it just come really late for me all come down to a basically I played in a Devon game so I played for the county but in a year above my age right okay pure luck but like my school teacher at the time at Biddeford College he was involved in the Devon setup. Um, they needed an extra player I wasn't affiliated to any team and it was back then when you had Devon trials effectively so it weren't a proper game for them but it was like you would play at Plymouth and it would be basically you'd play the Plymouth team against a Devon team and it would be basically at Exeter and Torquay players but this one was at Exeter mm -hmm. so they were like um, come up and out we need a, we, we've got a place for you playing left back year above your age so I was like alright happy days I'll, I'll play so went and played in that at Exeter, come off the pitch. And then um, the Exeter, Exeter lot come up to me. So Julian Tag come up to me and was like, look, really, really like what we see. I'm going to take all your details down and then um, we'll give you a ring in a week and then we'll sort out getting a trial. So obviously I come out of that like high as. I just wanted to be a pro footballer. Obviously I wanted to be at Plymouth, but Exeter was like pro club, brilliant. Got hey, you set up pretty good up there chance. as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah we could set, we, we yeah, set up yeah. up there. And I just wanted to be affiliated and wanted to go and see if I could do it. And um, yeah, in that week, I think I get a phone call the next day from Plymouth. Um, and now Plymouth want me. So like now I'm off the phone, I'm like, my dad, I'm like, Jesus, like this is like what we are. <laughs> but the difference was Plymouth basically bailed us the next day. Um, they went, we've got a training session on Thursday. Um, would like to come and be involved. So I was like, I've not signed anything for Exeter. Exeter haven't rung me back yet. Haven't haven't texted us, haven't messaged us to say, look, we're going to think they just said, we'll bail you in a week's time. Yeah. So like, I think this was like about two days later, I think. This, yeah, cause it was in the week we played the Devon game. I think that was on a Tuesday or something like that. So then, yeah, on the first day, pulled up the Plymouth, um, did a training session for an hour, pulled me after that. They said, look, we need you to sign this thing. So it's a six-week trial. So that stops anyone else going obviously I don't know I might say no between the two if they know Exit had spoke to them or whatever uh, so I signed a six week trial uh, which is standard everyone signs that um, but that means I couldn't now go to Exeter so if Exeter ring up I've got to say well for six weeks now I'm here and they involved me in the first game so I trained on the first day involved me on a game on a Saturday which I didn't know at the time but obviously then when I got into it realised that was a bit like no one really gets involved straight away you train for a couple of weeks then you might get a game here and there yeah, and then offered me a two-year... Where did, where did you play as a kid? So I was a Somewhere left back. Out. Left yeah, back. Yeah, left, left back, back yeah. yeah. I was a left back. A left winger, really, as a kid. Was well, sure. Yeah, like scoring goals. <laughs> like, couldn't do that in the pros. Um, so, yeah, but then dropped back to left back. And then, um, yeah, went there. I said, like, they offered me a two-year deal on the Saturday after the first game. So I'd gone, like, within the space of one week, I'd gone from no one knowing me to, like, now I'm two-year contract at Plymouth. And then I got a phone call, I think it was on the Sunday or the Monday from Exeter saying we've um, sorted it out now we'd like you to come down for a trial and then we were like well within a week yeah. like yeah, we'll they've signed a six week trial and now signed a two year contract and yeah that's done. the end of it yeah. Yeah. yeah that's really cool you must have been buzzing at the time yeah it was crazy buzzing cause... yeah but then luck again like with where I went to Exeter and you do need luck like you can't. I can't lie like you, you do need luck at the right times the bloke that tried to sign was Eamon Dolan so Eamon Dolan rest his soul like obviously he's passed away unfortunately um he was the youth team, run the whole youth setup. So he was the one who tried to sign me. It got passed to him from Taggy. 
uh, like what we saw, which is great. But then by the time I turned pro at Plymouth, he was the first team manager at Exeter. Oh, right. so then you got a decent little and So he rung me up when I was going out on loan and said, look, we'd, we'd love you to come down. Do you, fancy, do you want to come down and done the deal down there? Yeah. How does it feel going out on loan? I, I read something years ago about David Beckham because <coughs> I think he was at United and then went to Preston, I think, on yeah, loan. Did, yeah. And I read something about the fact that like, mentally when he went out on loan, he almost thought his career was over because he was like, mm. oh, I haven't made it. I'm not good enough. I'm not in the first team or in the team that I'm contracted to. I've been loaned out. Do you, did you look at it in that way or is it is it kind of just within football, one of those things that people mostly do? Yeah, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I sort of maybe took a different take on it, if I was honest. I was sort of like... I always felt like I was quite honest with myself, playing wise. And if I was being completely honest, I was, however old, I think 18 at the time, the, the lads were in the championship. We had big players at that stage coming in, doing well, obviously playing against massive football clubs every week. And you had a good I team then, didn't you? Yeah, we had, a, we had a good side. And I, and I looked at it, I'll be honest, and I was like, just fresh out of youth team. I weren't good enough. I, d I don't think I was good enough to play in the championship at that stage. Um, I wasn't one of these freak kids you see come through and they just step in like, we had Dan Gosling unbelievable coming at 16 looked like he was 27 like do you know what I mean he was, he was unbelievable he had a good, he's um, gone on to have a good career yeah and, and had a great he has, career yeah, he's good, a really, really good, career, good player yeah. like really yeah. consistent at such a young age but I wasn't that I was, I was a bit smaller then I grew up sort of like got knocked about in a conference which helped me and I just looked at it like do you know what like X is a pro football club as well this is what I dreamed of doing like so I want to play for Plymouth so that the whole aim is to get back there but I agreed I wasn't good enough at the time, like so. I tried to look at it like in two years' time or a year's time, I'll be better because I've now played men's football. I've been knocked about a bit, especially in the conference. I was playing centre half. Yeah, you playing up against some strikers back then as well that could proper leave one on you. Um, so it, it turned me into a man. And had I not done that, I wouldn't have made the gap. It can it can ruin your career, can it? Going into two yeah. years, being got thrown into a first team, especially like you said in the championship, you don't do that well because you're not quite ready, and then. Sometimes you do just get thrown away in football. It's like, you it know, is, he's yeah. not done well, you know, he's not ready, he's not good enough. Yeah. And then that's it. Sometimes it's definitely advantageous. You get, like you said, you get those freak lads who is like silly good at 17 and they can play, you know, straight in the first team. And they just got that like unbelievable talent at times. And you usually find though, I, well, again, just looking from the outside in, you usually find they're usually um, like forward players. Yeah. Those like silky wingers or, you know, good centre mids, you know, yeah. a lot of time, if you're a young defender coming through, unless you're an absolute fucking monster. Mm. No one trusts, yeah, no one trusts it's, you it to is, send off. It's, yeah, yeah. It is, it's, it's like, you know, it's like being a young goalkeeper. Yeah. If you're a young goalkeeper, it's, it's fucking tough, isn't it? Yeah. You know I mean, unless you are mustard. Yeah. Unless you are like head and shoulders above everyone. And I went, I went, the, I, yeah, I went the biggest of 18 year olds, but in the first team at the time, you had like Paul Watton, you had Graham Coughlin, they were men. Like they were they were men, big beast, boys, beast weren't men. They? So like I'm looking at it, going, well, how can I replace one of these? Like I'm not as good as they are. Like and they were like, yeah, yeah, Coco was like just a beast. He's a he? monster. Yeah, yeah, he was a monster. So he was he was great, and he was great with me. Is he like, a good lad. Yeah, yeah, yeah brilliant. Yeah, like obviously yeah. no Coco, obviously through the years now from when he's managed different clubs and stuff like that. And he was he was he was great, like amazing, like. But uh, they helped me. I said I went to Exeter, and it's slightly different because it's not the level of what Plymouth was. Mm. But it's just it's just good to go and get knocked about. Like, what was just, it like yeah. being a youngster in the change rooms with that sort of stuff? Was a bit of I uh, get bullied, like yeah, yeah was it? <laughs> yeah. Was it yeah. like yeah. back then? Like I said, because yeah. like it's, God, yeah, like it's, any, it was any, mad, any decent like, little stories. Well, you used to have like things. Obviously, you don't do it no more because it's just like we tried to keep this sort of going. Like when we were obviously at Plymouth Flight thing, so like you have things like Christmas bonuses, obviously clean boots. It's died off a little bit now. The lads, like the young kids now, like you can't get them to do jobs now. Can you like, not? You're not allowed to do it effectively oh, really? now. But like back then. Like we'd keep it going, so you'd have to come and sing for your bonus. You'd get all the first team there, and <laughs> get them up in front of you, make them awkward. Like, but it's just a bit of a learning thing. We only ever did it like that. But our one, like when I was in the youth team, like they would do, you'd do their boots every year. If they weren't done properly, like the pros would throw them out or thing, you'd be doing them again. Like, like really? made sure, yeah, you took pride in it because yeah. obviously the first team and that, and like, uh, yeah, for our Christmas bonus, it was like it was it was different. So like, you'd obviously they'd pay you out, and you'd have a little bit of a meal at Christmas or whatever, and. um yeah, our one, we had to do, uh, one of them was like, not a naked nativity play, but it was in your pants. <laughs> <laughs> so like, they'd get the first team to call you down and then we'd have to come up with this big nativity play for Christmas and then like you get what, down. What, just you and the, the younger lads? The youth team boys, yeah. <laughs> and you do it in like fours and fives and then they'd vote on who they think's the best and then you might get a little bit more money if you've done it decent. But yeah, you'd be going down into the first team dressing room, all the first team there, managing everyone, everyone's there. 
and like yeah you've got a little stage there like in your, <laughs> but, but you're in your pants or or i've seen it gone i've seen it done naked as well like but nowadays like you you wouldn't get you wouldn't be allowed yeah. to do it like, <laughs> you know what I mean? like you, yeah, yeah singing's about as far as it goes now but back then yeah it was like acted out singing you could do whatever you wanted it was almost a bit of an extra that's fucking class that is yeah, funny you know, earn your money. but like they were like i'll be honest they were like pros are fucking horrible back in the day or oh, like when we were kids yeah. mate. but we, you think that what they probably had to go oh, through you imagine yeah. the generation before that yeah you know what i mean that yeah you know, it was probably bad what they were like to you but imagine yeah. that fucking generation before but that's all they used to say because they were like Watsy was obviously Paul Watton obviously ledge like thing I love Watsy but he was he was the worst he was, was he? he was a mad one for it but he only treated you like because he got done I remember mm, yeah. him telling a story about um, you know, back in the day obviously the old ground you had a bit of like the grass there out the front of the ground didn't you and you had the yeah. old Mayflower over away yeah and there used to be a fair on there didn't they used yeah. to be the fair he, he said like when he was like a youth team boy you got the big metal skips with all the boots in mm. said pros butt naked him like took all his gear off <laughs> banged him in the skip done it up <laughs> wheeled it into the middle of the fair unclipped it left it there then he's had to get out of it naked and bring the skip back <laughs> <laughs> so like what he did no to you was like was never at that level yeah. but like yeah he'd treat you like thing but I'll be honest like where the obviously the old change rooms used to be we used to have to get to the boot room you'd have to walk in front of the first team boys but I'd go around the outside I'd just go out around the front of the ground come in through the like through the laundry you know, <laughs> get the boots and go out and clean them because if you got caught on the wrong day you get like yeah you just get bundled your clothes get ripped off you're like fucking cut up <laughs> it was, yeah it's just fucking one of those places like really difficult place but like funny at the same time yeah. that's mad isn't it like that, that's the sort of shit you'd expect from like, like rugby lads and military lads I didn't think that you're nah, like, no, football, nah, football's yeah. horrendous mate Not even now. like amateur yeah. football mate some of the stuff yeah. that even we've done at our level like that sort of like semi pro and lower level we've yeah. been P&D mate and he's, we used to be changed on the side of the pitch and we've had all sorts mate we've mm. had all sorts of just it's just, it's just shit. banter isn't it like it is, I miss it, it. Right that's the only then. thing I miss though yeah, I don't actually miss football I miss that side of it I miss I miss all the boys I miss doing shit like that you know what I mean it, it, it's, you can't beat it. It you has. Do, it. It's, it's gone slightly, isn't it? Like in terms of like yeah. certain things you can and can't do now. I want to get that. People got in trouble with a lot of things they've done, but like <laughs> it was always taken in. Like so I, I was quite lucky. You might speak to another lad that was in my youth team that probably might have a different take on it, because like I was quite liked by them playing in the reserves every week. So I was like quite not there, but I was in that middle bit, train with them a lot, stuff like that. So I. I I got like a fair bit of respect off the first team boys, but they'd fucking take the piss out of you and, and do all that stuff, yeah. But there was other lads in our youth team that how did the foreign how, how did the foreign lads cope with that? Like the foreign know, boys, yeah, yeah the so foreign boys were they they get involved in that because that sort of come in a bit thing because early on in that like we didn't have obviously youth team wise back then you wouldn't have had any foreign boys or whatever and then the first team boys that started to come in the better we did in the champ the more yeah, foreign okay. boys who did in. you have then like did you have did you have like Peter Mosey and yeah and so they come in when I was and playing and yeah so Akos and Mosey yeah. Team Art them boys they were all quiet oh, man, I forgot about yeah, yeah yeah they were all quiet like Team Art weren't he was yeah, was he was he a nutter well, he's, he's, he's got a shed wasn't he yeah he's got like a party trick that's like I've never seen anyone do it so we're on a night out and like we sit at the bar like, having a couple of drinks or whatever like that Timo's a big lad and he like yeah. big lunatic yeah, and he's um, he's drinking his beer like and he goes yeah. like saying to everyone have you seen this have you seen this party trick I've got a good party trick for you gone like nah gone like what is it not not knowing what he's going to do so he's taking he's got pretty much full beer down the old beer and he's just looked at the glass like that and he's just fucking eating it I'm eating fucking, it honestly I've never seen anyone do it he's just gone like that bang crunch at the glass fucking glass pouring down his thing cut his mouth bit of blood coming down his thing just fucking <laughs> edit, edit it all the way down to the bottom of the thing just fucking what? Threw, threw the glass away and like all the boys like looking around going <laughs> what the fuck is this <laughs> like, I was like he's just is he still alive now this guy yeah, yeah. he's mad he had the worst he had he's the worst angry fucking fucker. injury I've ever seen what did he do pitch. So we played we played Wolves Wolves at Molyneux last game of the season. Lovely ground. Yeah, like lovely ground, wicked ground. And we're, we're decent this time thing. Playing centre half, I'm playing left back. Ball comes up. I don't know why he was there, but Alakobi. Yeah, yeah. Alakobi, yeah, yeah. big, strong. Big boy. Big, big, big strong, boy. Man. Like then the two of them going together like a car crash. Um, but I don't know why it was. The team was obviously centre half and the ball's come up and Alakobi's gone to challenge it to flick it on, but he's playing left back. So I don't know what, I, I don't know why he was there. Yeah. He's flicked it on and t is obviously a big edit, kick it, centre half. He's come through the back of him to edit. But Alakobi's flicked it first. He's head butted the back of his head. 
and the noise, it just oh. he cleaned him straight out. I've like, we've all run over to him. He's got blood come out his ear, blood come out his nose. He's completely, completely knocked out on his thing. And his forehead has got, if someone hit a golf ball into in your forehead, his whole forehead missing and it's dented in that way. Oh, and when it inwards, just, and fuck. It's, and it's breathing like that. And then he had to be obviously rushed straight to hospital. He's got a scar from one ear to the other where they've pulled his face down and replated his old forehead. It's, it's the worst injury I've, I've ever seen. Dude, and he was like a fucking, honestly, if you'd seen him, he was like a train. Mate, that, yeah. boom. I can oh. imagine, like, I used to watch him and he just, he, that was all his game was, wasn't it? Yeah. He was just smashing people. That's fucking mad. <laughs> That's the same injury, you know, that um, in MMA, there's a there's a guy from London called Michael Venom Page. Yeah. And he hit this Brazilian guy, Cyborg, with a flying knee. Mm. And, did, and the same thing, the guy went in for a shot and he jumped and hit him with his knee. Same thing, just put Concaved, his... Concaved, yeah. Yeah, but it, it was yeah. a career ender for him. Was yeah. it the same for this guy? Oh, he's did back he, the next year. Did, really? Back the next year. Which metal, is metal player, probably, absolutely yeah. ridiculous. Obviously, it was horrible because the last game of the season as well. And you know, that's that, that game where like yeah. you want to get the game done, get on holiday, go and have a beer, whatever you want to do. Um, it happened a lot it was horrible because then obviously he's rushed straight to hospital we're not sure if we're going on obviously he stayed there for a couple of days in hospital went away all like that so ruins obviously ruins your holiday but he, he had it all stitched up obviously from here to here like um, what's the sky then? Four so metal is it yeah. goes from here what to here right over the top of his head right over the top of his head pulled your, for, your head down I had to put, to put your face off yeah, basically to, to get re, redo it, it yeah. but then he was he come back like obviously the season after and he had like, he, he just, Tima, he's just a mad, mad fucking like hard, hard as nails. But he had like, he had to play with like, he had um, sort of an headband with like a padded headband. Mm -hmm. So he had that for a while, but then he just threw that off and he was done. Edding balls again. And yeah. he's been all right ever since like. Yeah, that's interesting because you find that with injuries in all sports, don't you? You can put the fear in people yeah. and they're never the same after an injury, yeah. even if their like body's recovered, that their head just didn't get straight. Yeah. The trouble is you'd never, you'd never do anything if you worried about the consequences yeah. of what could happen. You wouldn't walk across the street, would you? So you, you know it can happen in football. Yeah. I look at, obviously, like back to mine, like like my ankle ended my career, mm. like which was a bad injury. But I look at something like that I saw him go through mm. and some of the leg breaks and things like that I've seen. Yeah, I broke my arm in football. Really? Yeah, I yeah. my humorous. Horrendous. Well, one-on-one -on -one with a keeper, he come out, big boy, and I think the keeper, he's, like, took me out and put my arm out flat, oh. and it just snapped, like, out. It was, like, stinking. I was, like, laid out. Oh. It's horrible, isn't it? But you get back from him, didn't you? Yeah, it's, it's and, and you, yeah. you wouldn't even know I had that now. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah, that took a good year, nearly, to You must to have been casted right up to you. No, what it? they do yeah. with that is it, because they can't cast it because of where oh, it is. Oh, they can't cast it, yeah. No, so what they do is they... They splint it. Yeah. They splint it and that's it. You just really, literally yeah. are stuck like this and they'll splint it with a bar through either side. Yeah. And then, because I was only 28, they, they just basically hoped that it would knit. If it didn't knit, then I would have had to have surgery. Yeah. Um, yeah, but they were really concerned because there's a... Uh, the, the nerve that runs down your arm. Yeah. If they nick that in the surgery, you can make it, give you yeah. a gammy hand. So I was really reluctant to have the surgery. I was like, <laughs> surgery's like your last you resort. Know, and he done oh, mate, that. I was, uh, yeah, I broke my wrist and my arm in football. Yeah. And um, yeah, both times I've like really thought not to, to, to have the surgery, you know, because so it, I just yeah. feel like if I can naturally, and it's definitely been the best option yeah. because I know people that, you know, clients and different people that have had surgeries on their wrists and they got plates and this and that. And they always have problems with it. You know, sometimes it's needed, you know, but I was always like, if I can get away with not having it. Yeah, well, it can be really like sort of range of motion limiting when yeah. you've got sort of metal in your joints. Yeah. So yeah. Um, going back to the, the, the banter and the changing room stuff, we wanted to ask you about obviously the pressure in football and stuff and how, yeah. how that's kind of managed, I guess, from a personal level, but also from a captain perspective as well. I almost feel like that sort of banter would like prepare young lads for that pressure because I think some lads and we'll ask you as well about whether some lads it, it kind of ruined them and they just weren't successful as a result but it feels like that sort of banter just preps you then so when you're in front of the media in front of the crowd and you're getting fucking booed and getting a bad time you have a bad game it toughens you up enough did you find that? Yeah it does it also what it does as well is it sticks you all together so all this stuff is like made to put you in your un un uncomfortable make you in that sort of zone but if you do it and the lads respond to it and these these little nativity things and singing and stuff like that but it's about like a bond you get with everyone so when you do go over the white line if you're having a bad time and it's hard and it is with pressure of football like it's brutal but you've got 10 other lads sat there with you and all the rest on the bench that are you're all together the ones who don't get involved in that stuff and they sort of and away from it they're the ones who have a bit of an harder time because when you need digging out and you need help 
that help might not be there if you went sort of you don't get yeah. that bond with everyone. Knitted in with mm. everyone. Yeah, but the pr- the pressure of football, it's part. I don't. I miss. I miss it to a certain degree because it. It's just part of it, and you sort of learn to deal with it. And I think the older you get, the anxiety side of it and things like that, you sort of learn to turn it into a positive. So, like, I never played a game of football that I weren't nervous for. Mm. Um, I always felt when I was younger, like when you get the real butterflies when you're early on, you start playing the first team. I used to look at people at 30, 35 years old and think, it must be easy for them because they've done it for so many years. It probably won't feel that anymore. I was as nervous for my last game as I was for my first one. It just it never changes, but all it does is I I learn to deal with it in the right way, and then then the, them nerves then become a positive. It makes gives you a little bit extra, but there's there's nothing really you can speak to people. You can speak to kids. You can sit them down. Very very hard to like really hard to put that in place because when you walk over the white line and there is twenty thirty forty fifty thousand people there, a lot. Of it's a lot of people, right? But you just that just comes through trusting that you're good enough and all the prep you've done and all the work you've done, all that's in place. My biggest one really because like I found once you got over Wednesday, I felt Thursday was difficult because Thursday was a bit of a shape day, effectively a bit of a detailed day in terms of training. So you do a lot of work on what they're going to be doing, what we're going to do to combat it. So you start getting it, starts getting ramped up. Friday's a bit more of a fun day, but you, that's nervous then Friday, go home can't concentrate on the TV, can't really concentrate on phone calls, stuff like that, because it just it just takes over. But then you learn to deal with it, but it's just it just never leaves you. Saturday morning, horrendous. <laughs> amount of times I've been to games and feel like I'm going to be sick. Really? Um, yeah, real, real nervous. Really, really Is nervous. Is there any lads that were stupidly talented and you thought they were really going to make it and they just couldn't fucking handle the nerves? The the nerve side of it, anyone like that? that you- yeah, I've seen it happen. Yeah. I've seen it happen with a couple that were just so caught up in it the deal that they just couldn't function on the thing. Unbelievable training players. You see it every now and again. Someone who on training, it's still pressure on training because you've got to impress because you want to play. But, but it's not again, it's no not in front of 30,000 yeah, people. Yeah, it's nowhere so. near like, and you ain't got people shouting this and that and some of the stuff you get shouted at you is, it could take you off your game. It's horrible. Uh, but it's part of it. Um, but you learn to block it out. Like It's just a way of coping with it really. And you only get that through doing it. You can only ever know if you can handle it by putting being put in it. Um, but there are lads I've seen um, great in training can do everything you look at them and you think oh, I'd love the quality you've got walk over the white line on a Saturday with thousands of people there and just can't do it just can't function with it you do you see it so much across so many sports we talk about it in fighting again where you've got mm. your gym heroes who just chin everybody in the gym and yeah. then you've got your game day players which are the guys that don't do so well in the gym but when it comes to competing they're yeah. just mentally they're dialed in yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost you get into like a almost like a zone of it like and every, you can block everything out when you talk about the crowd like you go from sort of I would say some of the lower crowds you play at they can be so, worse sometimes because then you can actually hear the yeah, I was going to say they're there. really close as well yeah, they? Yeah. some of those crowds yeah. like... but then you go higher and higher and you play in front of 60, what's, the, what's the biggest crowd you played in front of um, did 67 at Old Trafford and then Wembley obviously was slightly bigger again like so they're like they're, but it's, it's noise so it's like as much as I want to like sit here and go like you, you can feel it when you're doing well and they're behind you the noise and the feeling of it is like, it's hard to explain it's amazing like when it happens but it is just noise so like you don't pick out the odd geezer the odd shout that yeah yeah <laughs> you don't hear that like I said you just hear a bank of noise like pushing you so it's like it's weird but you can sort of take yourself away from that and unless the ball goes out for a throw in I had that Old Trafford. I was, I was, I was, Imagine you I was had it a lot as well, was not you? Yeah, like and then you around. do sit there. If the ball's out of play or someone's injured, Wembley's the same. Every every big club I've played that's like the same. But you do tend yourself, you find yourself like you have a little look and it's huge. But like when you're playing, you don't see anything other than you're on the pitch against other 11 men and that's just what it is like. So then you just tend to block it out and then it's after where you sit there and you go, fucking hell, that was unbelievable, wasn't it? A massive ground, that. Wicked. But <laughs> when you're doing it, it's, it's, it's so strange because like going back to the nerves and that like as soon as the whistle blows I lost every single bit of nerves I had as soon as the whistle went but then after the game every single game I probably played in after the game I'd go home and be like sitting and be like why do I worry about that <laughs> why do I worry why, do, why, do, why have I just not ruined my yeah, like yeah. last couple of days but I, it was every single game but I think it's I think that happens it's just because it, it's important right it just gives it you Me just too. give a shit yeah. and yeah. I, I think you find that with all sorts whether it's a job interview a fight a football match I think if it matters to you yeah. like it's normal to feel nervous yeah. and you made the point about you just 
found ways to kind of manage and cope yeah. with those nerves. And I think that's the key thing. It's just those management strategies around it. Yeah. Um, because I think, yeah, most people who give a shit and are passionate about what they're doing are going to experience the same nerves yeah. regardless of what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. I think it was, it was one of them, like I sort of, early on I sort of fell into it. But it's little things for me, like it's almost like a, I was trying to tell like the lads that I coach now and things like that. It's almost like everyone gets anxious, everyone gets nerves. He said, when you care about saying, it's, you can't get rid of them. They will come for every time you're in that position. And in football, they come every week and they come twice a week, depending on what, how many games you've got. But I always found like, it was about like preparation. That was the that was the key thing for me. So it was preparation. If I control what I can control in terms of eating, hydration, things like this, that I could sit in the dressing room before I went out on a Saturday and I'd eat the right food. So I knew I was right. I ate the same thing before every game. Obviously, you only for home games. So it was like a chicken treat. So pasta I used to do. <laughs> but I'd do that for every home game. Yeah. Nice. Because it's the only one I control. So you'd go away and the food's controlled yeah. for you. But I'd still have the same effectively not what I'd have at home yeah. but I'd have the same away meal every time so I knew like there's a tick that one's done so if I ever sat and thought oh, have I got enough energy today like, yeah because I've eaten those right things yeah. am I hydrated enough yeah I've done this did I sleep the right times did I wake up the right time it's it's just little I had little check things mm. that I needed to go for them yeah that I needed to make sure they were right so then on a Saturday before I walked out I could sit there and be like I'm ready I can play yeah, it's a good show. Did you ever do any um, strategies like visualization or work with um, like sports psychologists or anything? Yeah, so they they bought one in at Plymouth. Did they? Um, <laughs> yeah, they bought one in at Plymouth. Like when we were having a bit of a bad time, they bought one in. What, so what? Quite recently. No, nah, yeah, this was like obviously um, when Derek Adams was manager. Right. He bought, okay. He, he where, bought where, one in. So you, before you then League Two. League yeah, two? so we'd have been League Two then. League, two, uh, yeah. league One, I think, when we were struggling with it. Was that, and then been. the financial trouble started then, wasn't it? No, nah, that was, was before. That? All the financial trouble was happened it? before that, yeah. So that come at the end of the championship era. So that oh, yeah. Years ago, yeah. yeah. So that was the bit in but that was the bit in between. And then Derek Adams come round, sort of the club out, started moving forward. Um and then yeah, we did well on the rim. Uh but yeah, I've had it at certain clubs, we bought one on here, which is it's good. I think it works better one v one. One on one, if I'm being honest, because especially think, with the fucking ban and in the, in the changing room, I mean. they just ruin you if you so we're, we're, start crying on somebody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we had lads in that dressing room, like I don't. Some people need it more than others, yeah. don't they? I always felt that I was like quite good with that, so I felt some of the stuff they would tell you, I'd already be doing it. So they talk about it, sort of a checklist and things like this, or visualization, what you're doing. But I'd done that since I was young, so like I would do that on a Friday night. I'd find myself drifting away into like, right, what am I going to do? Like picturing stuff, like seeing stuff happening and then before a game like right this is what I'm going to do like thing like that things change and they adapt but like I did that visualization so when they come and spoke about it I was sitting there thinking well I already do that so like and I know a lot of other lads do but when you get a group of footballers together and they're you're trying to do you're trying to do like a talk like a serious talk and that it's fucking hard because like the lads want to fuck about it's basically like a group of fucking school kids <laughs> so like you'll get like I remember one and like so Graham Carey was one of my closest lads he was like he was such a good lad such a good player baller baller so good yeah. funny fucker so like good. as well was so it like yeah. yeah so we'd be in there sit together all the time room together like we're really close and like it'd go silent we'd get we'd be doing this stuff and the stuff he'd be like right shut your eyes and like he's gonna picture this stuff so all the boys sat there and he's going through like a breathing exercise and one of the lads will fart and it's like <laughs> <laughs> and you just you just can't fucking be serious like and then I'm like the same as G like fucking kid at art like and like, I'm then like I can't concentrate on anything because I'm fucking dying like laughing, <laughs> yeah, laughing like, yeah. and then it's like you have to be told to like sort of like calm down and like you're fucking 30 years old doing that <laughs> It's just like, yeah, it's like you'd never leave school. But if you were to do that sort of thing, I know a lot of lads, one of my closest mates, one of my best mates, a lad called Jamie Mackett used to be here. I know he used one, um, a 1v1 one pretty much throughout the whole of his career. Yeah, a good career. Well. Massively. Yeah. He had a great career. Yeah. Hell, he had a yeah. great yeah. career. Baller. Yeah, so it, do, it does really help. There's a massive place for it. I think nowadays, obviously, it's, it, it's more key than, than ever, really. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that probably goes hand in hand with like, you know, the, just the mental side of everything, isn't it? Mm. Whether it's living in sport. You, you mentioned um, that you kind of, when you went off on, on loan, you kind of got knocked around a little bit. Mm. And I know I mentioned offline that I kind of played football as a kid growing up. So going back 25 years ago or so and, and uh, more. Um, but I noticed in that time that like football changed like loads in mm. regard to the style of play. Um, so I, I guess when I was growing up at school, you had like really hard players, 
like players like Julian Dix at like West Ham, who just tough boys, yeah, just chopping people down. Obviously, grew up watching like Roy Keane just running through people's knees, yeah. And then, kind of as time's gone on, and, and more of the, the continental lads come over, and the style of football changed. Did you notice that at kind of your level as well? And yeah, definitely. I think I noticed it more. It got more apparent if, if I look at the start of my career compared to the end of it. Yeah, it's a completely different philosophy on plan. Now, I think if I'd started when I finished, I would have then. I, I, I was a left back. I wanted to be a centre half, really. Um, preferred centre half. Got on the ball slightly more, um, but I weren't I weren't quite big enough when I was younger to play it. Obviously, Exeter gave me a bit of a chance to get knocked about, and I grew into it. And I played centre half for Plymouth for quite a few uh, quite a few games, but I was probably better at a left back yeah. size wise and yeah, ability wise. But I, I like playing on the left, like to get up and back as well. Um, but yeah, if it was now, like you. You got centre half. Centre half don't need to be six foot five months yeah, anymore. Like, you thinking, need to be yeah. footballers. So that suited me. Mm. If I if I had my time again, like I would have been like, well, no, nah, actually, I'm going to make myself because I think if I was being completely honest, I think if I, I think if I pigeonholed myself rather than go to left back, I think it was a good left back, but I think potentially I would have been a lot better centre half. Mm. I think um, reading the game wise was probably one of my biggest assets. I think that was what I was really good at. Um, I was quick enough, not quick, but I was quick enough. Nowadays, like your fullbacks are like wingers, so that you need to be up and back. I was fit enough, um, I was really good in the air, albeit I weren't that big, and I, I could play. I was, good, I was good on the ball, so I just look at like our centre halves now, and I just look and think like, well, if I had my time again, I think I could have made myself into a better centre half. Well, look at look at Lissandro Martinez at United. You know yeah. what I mean? Martinez at United, he's exactly that, isn't he? Yeah, small. Well, he's way smaller than you, isn't he? But yeah. like, he's small. He's only like what five seven. Yeah, play centre half United, but he, he just runs a show. He just, he just yeah. fucking runs a show, mate. The game's just... gone away from like years ago. Like obviously when I went to extra and stuff like that, I played centre half, but up against proper centre forwards, mm. big, horrible. Yeah. They lump the ball up to him. Akin Fenwa. Yeah, Akin Fenwa. <laughs> oh, he's like a monster. You think like here, Mickey Evans. So yeah, I Mickey trained against Evans, Mickey mate, a lot. Yeah. I couldn't get anywhere near Mickey. Mickey was like, mate, bloke, he, was, like he was real strong bloke. So good at that. Yeah, way. and we used to play up to it. Like we, that was but tactics was. have changed. Yeah, exactly. It would, changed, be, yeah. it would be it would be hit a target man, get yeah. around the target man, get around him, yeah. flick off him. So blah, blah, blah. no one, no one now. you know, using. We was talking about this the other day. Even even formation changes of four four two. And then they changed it to like a four-five-one with yeah. wingers, one three, striker, five, and like that. yeah, three, four, two, yeah. and it just complete. It's completely changed isn't it? over the last yeah. what fifteen years, eighteen, yeah. seventeen years. The really, of, it went from like a four. Yeah. four everyone played a four-four-two back in the I early two yeah. thousands. Everyone, yeah. you know, you think of United treble winning team and all those types yeah. of teams. They all played a four-four-two. But then back back then as well, you do like obviously you do analysis like from the very start we do it you sit there but it was never about formation because you knew when you turned up they were 4 4 yeah, yeah exactly yeah, yeah. all you it was that, yeah. was like this player can do this this one can do this nowadays these play a 3 5 two, these play like whatever like thing and it's like this rolls in here this goes in here and everyone just goes in and out the only team that did it earlier than anyone else was probably obviously I never played at the top level but in my level it was probably Swansea Swansea would play in a way that you like don't know really they go into areas where you don't know where you should be marking it was, four, four, it, was two, so then. it was a gaffer then um can't remember who their gaffer was back then i remember, they really I remember that they, yeah they football. did didn't they and they yeah they were really good with it that was when they they, they was on the up from that point when they 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 really changed the whole yeah. club didn't they're they good footballers good thing but all the other games you play against your holes you play against like all these birmingham stuff yeah. like that they were just four four two and you just had to be better than your man but it was fairly easy because right the right winger is my my thing yeah, yeah. centre half thing, and everyone goes across, and it's it's very easy. There's no grey area. That's your man. You mark him. You're up against him today. Get the better of him. Now it's overloads, mate. It's overloads. Now, yeah. Yeah. Nowadays yeah. they overload everything. Everything's done in that way, and the the game's quicker now. The game's quicker. The pitches are better. The balls are better. Like it's boys are fit now as well. Boys are fit now. I think that's that's probably the biggest one of the biggest things as well that I see. I think the lads obviously they're off now, but that's the bit that I sort of started realizing. Very start of my career, I say like going to Exeter pre-season, you're basically getting off the plane from Magaluf, having had two weeks or whatever a week in Magaluf and going it's straight to first. Drinking training. culture changed. It changed. Like, like yeah, like the, the young lads yeah. coming through now. So I've different. said it before, they've stopped eighteen to thirty holidays and stuff yeah, like that, yeah. which I was baffled by. But they just don't do it anymore, yeah. do they? So is it the same in football? They yeah. just don't do that type of thing. Like well, you now. got you got like our lads will go off now, and this was from sort of thirty on. Probably I'd started noticing a real difference of it, and I had to do it because you have to stay fit. But like you probably allow yourself. I'd 
be off in the summer. Obviously, you're off for sort of five, six weeks. Season ends, and then you probably give yourself, I give myself two weeks, two and a half weeks, and then you've got to start going again. But then you start coming back in as fit as when you left. So when the fitness sessions happens at the end of the season, first day of pre-season here for the lads when they come back, they'll be as fit but fresher than they were when they left. Like people like Adam Randall is like unbelievable, like so fit, can't get near him. He's one of the ones that like, I love Rand's, such a good lad, such a good kid, great professional. Um, followed the same route as me, went to Torquay, went in the conference, played games, come back, done well for Plymouth, obviously done really well. Um, keeps himself really fit, don't give himself a lot of time off. But you have to stay with them now because like if you do what you used to do and you get off the plane and you've been on holiday, all inclusive, that was what it used to be. And then you get like back in the day, like you'd have Watsy all them boys and you're doing long runs, like it's different. At the start, you're doing like real long runs, not really fought out. It's just right, you're running point A to point B, Plimbridge, Salter Mouse, all them things we used to do. But the boys would have bin liners underneath their tops and like that. So bang a bin liner on, bang your gear on, bang your wet top on, it's boiling arts in the summer just sweating everything out and through six weeks of pre-season obviously by the time you get to the first game you're fit but nowadays the lads come back in shredded like ain't, like ain't been away <laughs> yeah so fit they do the fitness testing they're as fit as they were when they left mm. so then it's just about structure and how we play and it gives them more chance to do that but it's 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 unbelievable how, how fit they are now yeah and, and and do you think that is as a result of of that sort of modern culture and their their behaviour, or is that more of um, a focus on like strength and conditioning and S and C and sports science? That's and now a big thing, isn't it? So yeah. the S and C side of it and everything like that. You've got as well, like you've got plans. Like back back years ago when I started, like you weren't given a plan when you left. Like what's going to happen? Like nowadays, it's like right here's your plan: this day, that day, this day, this day. Everything sorted out, and then you do that, and you do more if you want to do it. But like that gets you to this level, and then when you get back in, like. Like with sports science and everything that's coming now, like gone are the days where like it's right, bang the gear on and you're running for five miles. It's just not there anymore. Everything's short, sharp, everything's quick, like everything's done at a real intensity and a real pace. And a lot of it's done with a ball. Whereas we didn't see a ball for like a week or two. You wouldn't you come back and you knew for like a week or two, you're in the depths of it, you're in the trenches. Like you just run, you won't see a ball. Nowadays you go back pre season, first day, balls are out. Which gives you an opportunity then to like, because that's the bit that- That was like at every need. level as well. Yeah, uh, they around, said, Back in the day, even at like, like shit level, amateur level, you used to just run. Like yeah. pre-season would be shit. You turn up, you'd just be running for two hours, getting ready for the season. But then as even later on, even at our level, then you got like lads that are doing academy work to be in our managers. And then they're bringing in, you know, getting a football out and be like, fucking hell, I've got football straight away. Straight away. Yeah. Straight away. Yeah. What, we're doing this with a football? And then they would integrate that. And that, that, yeah, it definitely, football's moved on loads, hasn't oh, it? It's, 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 it's moved on so much. There's a lot of science with it and everything like this. And there's loads of roles now within football. But they've not worked out a way, but they've just seen like everything's monitored now. Mm. So I think if you don't do it as well, you'd, you're left behind now. Oh, you, you Anyone who's yeah. not doing all that yeah. stuff and as those a lads team, are not doing it, they're do just well enough. fucking As a player, you won't play. So you, you have to do it. As I said, like, because everything's so monitored now, you've got RA monitor. So you've got a GPS on the back of your thing, the little vest thing you wear. You wear, wear them one in every training session. So they you can't you can't cheat. You can't lie. You can't you can't hide. We used to have in pre-season, I used to come like second to last because I was the laziest player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I fucking openly. <laughs> At least you yeah, all it, yeah, fucking terrible trainer. So I was always a terrible trainer, just never be asked, could be asked to run. That's, shit yeah. Some people, I've, I've seen unbelievable footballers be like that. But it's just, yeah, it's just how you build up your mentality and what you do like with it. But yeah, like, I just, um, I, I just always, I was always a pretty shit trainer, really. I love playing yeah. football and I'd always yeah. turn up on game day, be all right. But yeah, just, just, uh, just yeah. fucking training that. If it's cold, wet and I, I'll just be like, oh, I, I, love, I, too yeah, hard, like. I really enjoyed the, like the training side of it. But it yeah. was like, yeah. I didn't enjoy yes, pre-season, but though, it's mate, just, it? yeah, it's lifestyle. Like, yeah, I just, it's, yeah, when you're trying to, I don't know, it sounds a bit corny, but like, it's a dream, in it? Like, to be of course, a pro mate, footballer. Of course, mate, 100%. Like, I, just, I'm not, I never I'm, really lost that. Like I said, it was just part of it, like, for me. I think every every lad's yeah. dream, especially if you're into football growing up, would be to be a professional. You know what yeah. I mean? You speak to every single mm -hmm. lad who plays, even kicks a ball. Yeah. He'd be like, what do you want to be? Footballer. Mm -hmm. you know? It's mad how many, yeah. And it's horrible, really, because the reality of the well, strike. What is it? One percent, if that? Is it under that, I think? Yeah. It's under that. I think if you want to play in the Premier League, it's it's under that. It's a 0, 0.0 something if you want to play in the Premier League, if you're born in Europe, which is, yeah. But you can't ever tell anyone that. And I could never be told that when I was a kid because I wouldn't believe them for one. And yeah. I just believed that I would do it. Like I, I did actually always believe that I'd be a footballer. 
but you obviously have a lot of moments where you think that or oh, maybe I don't know but you just a self belief thing I suppose like and I want to do well but you need luck you need luck as much as I want to say like this thing you need it but I think you need to like you say you need to do the work you need to put yourself in a position that when luck comes along you take it yeah yeah exactly yeah. do you find that um, with the S&C and the sports science stuff now I obviously see a lot of lads up at the gym when you were starting out was like weight training and strength training a thing it, or was it more like, sort of yeah fears and, I'll be and, honest with you people went in the gym because they want to look better Okay. I said so people back in the day the lads who went in the gym I wouldn't overly say it was functional towards football I would just say it was like everyone be on a chest press everyone be on a bench press <laughs> do you know what I mean everyone would be on a bicep curl because and that got like obviously back in the day six to well six weeks two months from the season finishing like all the lads are knackered from playing but all of them are in the gym mm. and it's just a summer thing really back then but now it's really functional so like there's a lot of body work stuff now, uh, body weight stuff, sorry. Mm -hmm. They do, there's a, a lot of stuff that the boys do just to make sure their body's in, in unbelievable shape, but it's not just about one lad looking. Well, like, as a footballer, you can't be too bulky, can you? Nah, you, you just can't, can't be too bulky. Yeah. You can't have no that bulk. Because like yeah. yeah. if, if you're slow, like, you yeah. know, <laughs> it just fuck, it yeah. really does fuck your football. Well, with a game how quick it is now, yeah. like, it's you can't, you can't play with two carpets underneath your arm can you like looking like you can't move yeah, no, exactly. it's just not how the game is so you, you sort of learn and that's that's a massive thing that's changed and I think lads see it differently now our lads are like racing snakes I said like you're always forever like I played at I think they, they do your percentage of body fat all the time I played at probably between 7 and 8% mm. my body we had lads that were like 3 or 4 but then if you went over 10 then you're in fat club effectively <laughs> so like you'll be doing you're doing extra work like yeah. so you, you are monitored constantly weekly daily effectively like but because of all the data that's available now yeah but i think even from like an injury prevention point of view mm. like strength works like it's so important you know and, and you like you say you've you've got a perch with your work you just get hench yeah but then you've got you know different ways that you can manipulate the load and intensity where you're just building sort of neurological strength yeah um and then you start sort of transferring that to i don't know plyometric work mm. so that rate of force development so increasing increasing speed and power and pace so that seems like that's really really important sport and i when i was doing my uh i've got the green sport rehab similar to, to abs um and when we were doing that we were looking at the nordic curl protocol yeah, with your amis in it yeah horrible yeah <laughs> horrible <laughs> But have you ever done them? No, oh, I've never done it. No, do, do, you know, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know you're. Yeah, I've never they're, done it. They're yeah. horrible. But I think the um, the the evidence of that came out of Scandinavia. I think I think it might have been really? female football. We were right. trying to just sort of support with obviously hamstring tears and ACLs yeah. and everything. Yeah, and they put them on this protocol pre-season, and the injury rate just dropped. Yeah, dropped so much for hamstrings. It just bulletproofs your hamstrings. So that's just proof yeah. that actually that gym work and strength work can really help with injury prevention. You ever heard a hamstring go? You ever been there when a hamstring's gone? I've not um, had it go now. I've, yeah, I've, I've had an op on mine, but I've never actually had it ping. I've seen it go on pitch. I've seen once. someone. It looks like, like, like a, a gun, mate. Yeah, yeah. It was like a gun. He was running and it's just boom. He, he actually was like, what was that? Mate, whenever those yeah. tendons the, the come bruise, off. The bruise, mate. Like, f I've never seen anything. Horrible like, injuries. Yeah, Pre-season hours where you've yeah. gone into that rehab. I, Hammy's really awkward one to get back. I always feel like a quad or stuff like that is slightly easier. Armstrong's so temperamental in it because obviously you use it a lot for what you're doing. Um, but yeah, then Nordics come in sort of through my thing and it was like, fuck it, I hated them. <laughs> oh, <laughs> horrible, oh, mate. They burned, didn't they? Like, yeah. But it's, um, yeah. But that again, like sports science is like developed ways of like the lads now strengthen everything around the injury mm -hmm. as well as doing the injury. Whereas back in the day, you'd probably just treat the injury yeah. and now everything around it's stronger and takes the load off. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, Everything, everything's in a good place now. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, treat the player, not the injury. I think they say. Yeah, yeah. Um, when did you become captain? Um, so I come, it was about. I, I wouldn't know the actual year if I'm honest with you. I had it for about two or three, three years. I think I had it. I had it for a year when I was vice captain. Luke McCormick was captain mm -hmm. when Curtis Nelson left. Um, but I had it. Luke got injured straight away and didn't play a lot that season. So it's almost like a bit of a, a a lead into it for me. I basically become captain for that year, although I wouldn't say I was captain in that year. But it was I had to do everything and things like that. Obviously, we run it off the same off the pitch. He does the main stuff and things like that. Then I had it fully after that. Mm. So that was that was a big honour for me because it was something that I probably looked at when I was younger. And you turn up to Plymouth, and then you're in the schoolboys, and you're in the youth team, then you turn pro. 
and then to like captain a team that, that was that was a real big achievement for me I yeah I, I, I took a lot of pride off of that of getting given that because I always looked at captains Paul Watton was obviously my captain when I was here originally and it was always someone that like you really respected and could help people and I always took it in that way like I always tried to help the young lads try to help the lads like and you sort of in the middle of everything um, and it's an important role like and I, I, one I enjoyed like I loved it yeah so so for like somebody who's maybe not that into football these days like myself tell me what what a captain does and, and what the responsibilities of a captain is a lot but you, you almost you work as a sort of middleman effectively for want of a better word between the gaffer and the players so there'll be stuff that happens like we had it when obviously to do with um, we, we weren't having the best of time when I was captain and the lads are maybe not on the same page so it's a way of trying to knit that together but then it would be me that goes to the gaffer I'll be like look gaffer I think we need to pull this meeting or I think we need to speak about this the same way the gaffer comes to you my phone like you said like thing the gaffer would ring me up every now and again when it was um, Derek Adams I'd go back to the ground when all the lads had gone home sit there talk and like because you've got to look after both sides I'd never ever throw any of the lads under the bus. If someone said something and the gaffer wanted to know who said it, I would never a captain that was going to go. All right, it was him that said that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you, you you need you need a level you need the of trust as well. Yeah, yeah, trust trust, that. Yeah. But you need for other things as well. People are having problems off the pitch. Mm. So lads come in and I know it's obviously getting better now. We're talking and things like that. But lads hide it. I said so. Lads are having problems with drinking, gambling, relationships, stuff like that. And you notice you tend to try and pick up on things when you're captain. I think you take a little bit more time to evaluate everything and you look at it in a slightly different way. I certainly did when I was doing it. And then you might pull someone and be like, you're not quite right here. Or the gaffer might pull you and go, look, something's happened to him here. Take him out for a coffee or go and put an arm around them or go and help him and know you're there. Um, yeah, it's almost, it's almost like working as a bigger brother, effectively, for a minute. And they have someone that they can go to that they can sort of maybe vent to that you can go and relay to like a manager with things when it's not going quite right or it's going really well and you can be the middle one and when it's going really well it's about days off mm. it'd be one of the lads lads are shot so it'd be my job then to go to the gaff and go look I know you've got training planned for the first day or for a Tuesday yeah. the lads are really on their arse here yeah. I think it's a good I think you need to give them a day off I think it's I think yeah. it's that mm -hmm. so you go and look after them in that way as well so it's for the good stuff and the bad stuff yeah. it's yeah it's, it's an important one and obviously it's quite a yeah, it was, it was a big honour for me to get given it and um, something that I tried to do to the best of my ability, really. So yeah. um, what's your role now in the club? So I work as an ambassador for the club now. So I do a lot of the hospitality stuff. So um, I work in the, when we have the big hospitality for all the home games, I do a lot of the on-stage stuff, so the interviewing of the players and stuff like that. What's up with like transitioning from footballer yeah. to uh, stage talker? <laughs> At the start, I found it really weird. I said, because yeah. there's like, there can be best part of like maybe four or 500 people in there. Really? Like, I, play in, I play in football in front of thousands and like we spoke about, I had a way of dealing with that. So I was fine with that. It's completely fine. Um, speaking in front of a couple hundred people, I found that like more nerve wracking than anything. Like I was like, couldn't get me words out to start. Like I was sort of forever looking through the sheet thinking, oh, what am I doing? Like then I had to interview someone, which I found difficult to start with because like I'd always been the one being interviewed. So I've, I'm always been happy to answer questions and yeah. I've always feel like I can think on my feet and, and, and do that. But then to actually ask the questions and try and lead it in a way that you <laughs> yeah. want to get saying out of it, I've, I found that quite difficult to start. So that took a bit of learning, mm -hmm. a bit of looking. Um, but something I enjoy. And it keeps me around the first team boys. Obviously, I know the first team boys really well. Like, I take them out. Another part of my job is we take them out to schools and and stuff. I had sent going on at the minute in terms of like the trophies being taught yeah. around to pri uh, primary schools and that. I went to one yesterday. It's happening this morning, and it's happening not next week but the week after. To Do you work thing. closely with um, the community trust? Yeah. So that that's then I fall into the community trust. Then so then I work with a post sixteen group. Um, our lads come in. They do a BTEC program. We coach them every day, treat them like they're pros. They train sort of Monday, Tuesday, plan on Wednesday, train on a Friday. Yeah, it's a good program. That. Yeah, yeah, really, really good really program. Good. It yeah. gives them a, our, our aim for that is probably to either give them a better opportunity to be a, a better footballer come the finish of it and maybe play a better step when they finish. In, in the perfect world, obviously you'd like to put them into the youth team or make them into pro footballers. Reality being that doesn't happen very often. Um, or fed to universities they got opportunities then to get their grades up enough to get the right credits they need to get to university, go to America and do universities, stuff like that. I said, so just give them an opportunity, but it gives them a chance to see what it's like to be a footballer. Yeah, I would, honestly, I would have loved that. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. I would have loved yeah. that. You the, know bo- and I mean? the boys, the age, boys like, love it, yeah. Yeah, I know a few lads have done it. Yeah, I know a few lads have done it. Yeah, They all love it because they are effectively for two years like pros. Yeah, they really train cool. every day. We treat them out thing. They do the right thing. We're good with the training. We've got good coaches in our, yeah. our ranks of it. Obviously, they're taught by ones as well. You get away days. They get the odd overnight one when we play we play Norwich and stuff like that. Nice, yeah. They go overnight, so you get a bit of that that togetherness, that bond. I imagine they must improve quite a lot as well because they're yeah. going from playing maybe once or twice a week, three times a week to them playing every day yeah. and then really focusing on their football. You yeah. must get a few lads that do do get a lot better quite quickly do, because it's probably really the first well. opportunity from, especially being at school and then leaving school and then yeah. just doing a, like a B-Tech and then, you know, work playing football every day. Well, th- things change, didn't they? Because obviously, like when I said, like I left school when I was 15 and I moved to Plymouth a week a week after I left school but I was my birthday was July so I was a late bloomer with that um, so I was yeah I was I was 15 when I left school but now they have to stay in school that's like a bit longer in it so they can either go to I don't know City College or something like this and do a BTEC program or they can come to us and do the same BTEC program play football every day play football every day that's cool isn't it? yeah that's really yeah. cool why well, yeah. wouldn't you want to do it like it's a great one and we, and we got some really good players we got some really so, good players um, in our ranks since you've retired what's that been like yeah alright I've, I've struggle with it more than what I thought if I'm being completely honest I think it's been more difficult than what I planned on it being in what way um, just mentally really I miss it yeah yeah, miss it, play. yeah. It's, it's not just it's like there's parts of football I don't miss like when we talk about the anxiety side and the nervous side they're, they're really difficult to deal with and you're constantly on a battle with it you're constantly sort of being monitored and watched and everyone can have their say on you so it's, it's, a, it's a really difficult world football to be in brutal as well because you know one injury or one manager comes in or bad game you're not playing you it's it's so up and down but the life's really regimented everything's planned out for you it's this 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 through the week you imagine this, you're this, quite this. looked after as well you look well looked after you're looked up to by kids yeah, and things like this a really nice thing to have yeah. um and it's just yeah it's just a, it's just a really good thing to be in and it's a, a nice sense of achievement i suppose saying that you planned out to do that from a really young age and you're achieving and you're carrying out and then it just goes and then it's like you can't play football the one thing that made me happy through my life was playing football mm. I've said in all the pro football games I've had I, I enjoyed playing in them I said when you take out the anxiety and the nerves and everything happens before it and all that like I was saying when the whistle blows you're just playing football you're getting paid to play football you're going in to see your mates every day and play football with them and it's like you never leave school. It's just like you carry it through, <laughs> and get older, and yeah. get a slight bit more money, and, and and it's a better life. Like, but it's yeah, the dressing room going in every day. You could be having the worst day of your life. You walk through the dressing room, someone hammers you for what you got on or something like that. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just the, the banter side of it, and seeing the lads every day, and having that, and traveling away. Obviously, we do a lot of traveling down here, which is hard, but in the same breath, it's great as well because you're on the bus with the lads. It's just a good place to be, like, and it's just you lose that and it almost lose a little bit of direction, a little bit of focus on what you're doing and you're sort of left to be able to do stuff on your own. Some parts are great. The part the way I like obviously now where I work where I can take time off when I want now. So if I wanted a week off next week, I can take it. That's a life that I've never had. I said, because obviously the season runs for 10 months. You get this two month break, but you need to be fit within that to get back anyway. So you've got a certain window where you can go away on holiday, but that's it. You don't get Christmases off, anything like that. I spend Christmases in in hotel rooms I said like that's that's your life of it that's what you give up to do it you lose your nights out with your mates you lose the growing in with all your mates and that I'll do it all again in a heartbeat it's just you have to sacrifice quite a lot to get it and then it's yeah now I get that side of my life back where like on a Friday night I could go for a beer I can I haven't got to worry too much with what I eat you can do podcasts I can do podcasts <laughs> yeah I can like and I don't live as nervous as what I used to yeah. live mm. I can live a lot more flatter now which is yeah. a lot nicer nice. I'm not as up and down as what I used to be but there's, there's so many parts. How have you um, have you mentally then? So what have you done to combat that and, and to maybe feel a bit better? Yeah, well, I had a baby, so that's <laughs> taking my mind yeah. away from it, it, it a, does. a lot of things. <laughs> that, yes, that it will does. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really that's really helped. I said because although that's really difficult and thing, it's a completely different focus away from. Yeah. It takes me away from that. Um, the work inside of it, obviously, when I come into the ground and do the hospitality side of things and that, I do. I, I found that really difficult early on because I'm forever talking about the game or talking to the lads and then watching the game and just wanting to be out there. And I still watch still the game. still feel like you can play? Yeah. Yeah, I do. 
Yeah, I just. Do you, do you play like any any sort of nah, football now? Do you, I do you train? Played, or yeah, do you played in the odd charity games here and there. Yeah, they have one recently, didn't they? Yeah, we have one at the ground recently, so I played in that. Um, but I've probably played. Oh yeah, I reckon I probably played four games in three years. I think. No way. Yeah, <laughs> going from God. playing every single day of my life mm. since I was fifteen, yeah. sixteen to like now. Yes, so that that's difficult because like I do enjoy playing football. I love playing football. Mm. I was never one that really loved watching football. I like football. Yeah, I sported like Tottenham. Obviously, that's Spurs fan, was it? Yeah, Spurs fan. It's a tough time. It's always been a tough time. Yeah, though, I was basically yeah. <laughs> it's been a yeah. tough time. But that's where like my family thing. Obviously, I was born in Enfield, to the Tottenham area. But I was never, I was never one of them kids that loved going like, well, I need to watch every game of football. I need to do that. I did it every day of my life, so I needed a break. So like, um, golf was a break for me, and golf's helped me since thing. I've not played as much, obviously, due to my little one. But I always felt that golf would replace football for me. I love golf. I watch more golf than I watch football. Um, it's terrible. a real challenge. Oh, I've tried golf, mate. So I've tried so it a few times. I'm terrible at what, golf. What is it with ex-footballers and golf? It's, 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 it's relaxing. Thing. It's fun, but it, uh, it takes so much fucking time to learn. And if you, unless you can like really like dedicate some decent amount of time per week to, to do it, yeah. Honestly, mate, it's. Fucking, I just think me and the boys have tried it a few times. So some hard, of them were good. If you yeah. go with some people that are good, mate, you realise how shit you are. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's it, even someone. I can't imagine. Like those pros, the pros how they can be that good. Mm. It's such a hard sport, isn't it? Yeah, they're it's dedication such a hard to what they do. But yeah. They'll play around and then they'll come off and they'll practice. And I don't know, there's there's a thing with it. Like football was different. Obviously, I was naturally more gifted at that, obviously. I had to work. I'll have to work at golf to get myself decent. And then, but there's always forever, like you're always trying to get better at golf. You're always trying to get things. And it's just like yourself, really. It's just a battle with yourself. And it almost like you're playing little competitions and stuff like that at the weekend. It gives you a little bit of that nervy Bale's competition. The golf for Bale's tired. unbelievable. He's, yeah. He's, going he's, for he, it, he? he's got a life for it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, he can go and do what he wants. Like, he ain't got to work again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He probably got golf holes at his house, hasn't he? So, um, but that that would be for me, just because I love getting out outside. I like being like that. It's four hours where you can put your phone in your bag. You can just play and just get away from. So life frustrating life. though, isn't it? It's the most frustrating it thing. Well, but so you hit one good shot, yeah, and you think you, you, you go back. You think, you think you're class, and then the yeah, next yeah. one you're in the, in yeah. the sand, it's such, trees. <laughs> such a mad game, yeah. But yeah. I think that's when you get a real like thing of like. So I, I went to watch an event. My, my brother lives in Florida. Went to university out there, moved out there. I went up to the players up there when it was in June before so I was off on, on holiday obviously went and watched them and honestly like it's, it's like they play a different game and I always thought I was alright at golf I've got mates sort of miles better than me and I'm like very very average who's the best golfer at Argo got a couple? Uh, Ryan Hardy probably really yeah Ryan Hardy's a decent golfer Graham Carey back in the day was decent we've had some good golfers go through it Gaffer's a good golfer is he? he's a bit of a bandit <laughs> but he's <laughs> like uh, yeah, yeah but he's um, yeah we had a golf day recently actually the club one um, but my team won it to be fair and the gaffer had to hand me like the um, like the award for it like the thing he was Darren, Darren, fuming yeah. <laughs> he was fuming because like, yeah, he's like you think the shoe he's only a year older than me that's what I was about to say so he's a young lad isn't he yeah like, he's, he's young lad yeah. loves his golf fucking unbelievable manager I was about to say he's done manager. fucking hell of a job isn't he he has done a hell of a job because he's amazing yeah yeah he's a great great tactician isn't he yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he'll go far mate because he's so detailed in what he does and everything is just so well thought out, so well executed. The way he speaks is great. The information he gives is unbelievable. And he just, but you've got to really live and breathe football if you want to do that. And that's what he does. That's, you finish training, that's on to the next you one. You can that's see it like though when I go play this season, mate. God, yeah. like, yeah. at times, like, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah. been, you, haven't like, you haven't like demolished teams at times. You've like just picked them off. Yeah, if just, that makes sense for yeah. you, like just little one nil win, two yeah. nil here, one nil there. What, they yeah. were unbelievable. This year, oh, mate, like, crazy, like, yeah. absolutely crazy. Yeah. But he's instilled that like sort of belief in it, a way of playing, a philosophy in what he believes in, and he's brought players in to play it, and they've carried it out unbelievable now. And then we find ourselves back in the championship after I think 13, 14 years from being out of it, and. He deserves all the credit in the world because he's not only is he an unbelievable coach, he's such a good bloke. He's such a, a wicked lad. So I'm, bu I'm buzzing for him and all the boys because they all deserve it. Mm. They're going to do all right next season, you think? I hope so, yeah. Different now. Mm. Difficult league. I think we'll do fine. I think we'll be fine. I think we've got to sort of not get carried away with let's go and try and win this league now. Like I think it's let's try and see how we get on. It's... You're now looking at, and this is no disrespect at all, but like obviously last season you got you turn up the games, you got Port Vale, Acker and Stanley. They're difficult teams to play against, but not great spectacle when you go there to the ground and and so forth. This is now a completely different shift. 
because when you're turning up to Southampton, obviously down, oh, no, Leicester no. could come down, Everton but, could come down, no. and you've got all Leeds. these there. Yeah, Leeds be there, like it's you've got all these clubs now that are like a proper, proper, almost like a Premier League of yesterday. It's an extension of the Premier League, effectively yeah. the so Championship. It's, it's a it. big ramp up in terms, and that will be mentally as well, nervous wise. You'll get the, old, the lads will probably start getting police escorts into games now, get fired through, which we do when you're in a champ a lot of the time, and you turn up to these massive monster grounds. And it's real, real football. That like proper football. Yeah, wicked it's for the such fans. a big change, and mm, yeah. So, and in the money as well, like yeah, you know, Argo now have gone in for <laughs> they're going into the big leagues. Yeah, mm, going into the, the you know they're playing effectively yeah. Premier League clubs week in week mm, out. Yeah, you know. But you look at the money that flies around in it now. Now money does help, doesn't it? <laughs> like with the terms, especially for you think for us down here. It's, it's even harder for us because you've got to try and attract people completely away from what they are, their family, the amount of people I've played with that obviously get given a year contract or a two-year contract. Hopefully we might be able to do a little bit more with that now, but obviously financially what happened before, they won't make, make sure that don't happen again. But you're asking players to move from Manchester, from London, from Scotland, whatever. But they've all got families, they've got things like that. A lot of them leave their families where they are. Yeah. And then you're asking the lad to come down and leave your family one way, come down, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult to attract down. So money is one way of doing it. The club's obviously in a great position now. It's got bigger and bigger as it's gone. And this year, I think this year will be great, like for the fans and for the club, and that to to go back and be in a championship, like and compete at that level. Um, but it'll be different because mentally it's going to be hard because you're going to look at your next run of games. If you're not in a great run of form, you're going to probably look for your next five games, and you're going to be like. Well, there's Leicester, there's Southampton, yeah. there's mm-hmm. whatever, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like all that. Yeah. Like, and you look, you'll look through it, and you won't be able to do what you did last year, and you'll be able to go, should win that one, should win that one, yeah. should win that one. So it's it's different, yeah, mm-hmm. but it'd be great. I played in it for I don't know, three or four years. I played about hundred games in the championship, I think, and it was yeah. just a when you first completely broke, different feeling when you first start playing in the championship. That's when I had a season ticket. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I had a season ticket when I was like thirty. Yeah. 13, yeah, mm-hmm. so uh, I am... Um, Killing me with the age, you know, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it me every week, mate. <laughs> yeah, I was like 13 and then I, I, I had two seasons where I could get a season ticket and then I went into men's football mm-hmm. at 15-ish. Mm-hmm. So I could, the, that my, my, kick-offs, time, my it? kick-offs were yeah. three o'clock at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Like, it was a good time to Yeah, but they were great days and I think it will be, obviously the club's in a really good yeah. position and hopefully it will be really good days again, like, because it's it's great for the kids to see. What was Ebanks bike like? Yeah, Ebanks was class. One that I probably, I think, probably should have, I don't know, I've done better. He didn't have the attitude of what I had, um, but he was he was a better player than what I was, of course. But like um, he did, obviously went playing the Premier League, retired a bit earlier than I had. But he was um, yeah, because you had him and Ailsy up top, it was like unstoppable. Must have one Must have. You had a Mosi there, you had Akos there, you had Norris there. We're not believe Norris, mate. Norris was silly, wasn't he? Yeah. Was it? Did, um who was your left back that other than you it was um, me and Oji there you had Capaldi there Tony Capaldi Tony was a yeah, good player like, good. Solid, solid wasn't he mate. Oh, good solid, player, mate. but he played in national football mm. you go up to that level then, well, then no- you go Northern against, Ireland wasn't he Northern Ireland Northern, yeah, yeah Northern Ireland. but the level we'll play at now like you obviously get international breaks which is quite nice for the lads but you'll be now playing against international footballers like, in the championship yeah. you don't obviously tend to get that a lot in League 1 so the bump up is is huge it's huge for him. So you mentioned about the mentality with that and, and, and kind of wanted to kind of ask about that sort of stuff because we talked about the football pressure, mm-hmm. obviously with injuries. Um, I know that, you know, there's there's a couple of models that, that people go through when they get injured. One's a grief response model, which is the same model that you experience when people die. So you kind of get denial, depression, anger, reasoning, and then acceptance. So that in combination with the pressure of the football and now the high level, um, do you find that like mental health is much of an issue in, in pro football? Because people that like, we've talked about, it's like the dream, right? Dream job. Yeah. So surely it's not, but is it? I think it is though, because I think with that comes like the pressure and the expectation and a lot of weight on your shoulders. It feels like when you're playing, you've got a lot of, you're not just going out to play football for you and your mates anymore. You're going out to play football for the 20,000 people that are sat in the stand that are paid to come and watch you play. So mental health is huge, I think, in football. I think it's got dealt with better. I said like with psychologists and things like that coming in. I think it does help with the lads and the lads are a good group. I said you're in a, an area which is quite, not a lot of people can relate to because unless you've been in it, it's quite hard to really explain how that feels in it. And you're just forever in a cauldron of pressure really. 
Um, but they do the best job to sort of yeah. bring it. You lighten the load, like I said, like it's like you're in school. So that that's a way of lightening it and sticking together and being like that. Um, but certainly mental health, I've seen a lot of lads go through some real deep, deep times. Unfortunately, I see a lot of lads go through real deep times after they stop. Mm. Um, I've seen that be a case. I've obviously been quite wary of that myself because it has been difficult. Um, but yeah, mental health is obviously it's huge, isn't it? Like, and, and we're yeah. trying to help with people, and we have a lot of people come in and sort of workshops and stuff like that, and try and help the lads put them into the right frame of mind. Yeah. Does the club um, help you at all once you do retire? I know obviously you 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 got given a job as an ambassador, but is there is there anything else? So like, say say a lad has to retire through through whatever reason, do they get any sort of help from clubs? The, the club, not the just club, our club, but yeah, the, every club? Yeah, or? the clubs are quite good. Some are better than others. Um, we will always try and help. Um, there is, I think there's a duty of care in it if you've had someone come through your doors. Plymouth are really good because they are a family club. Mm. So we will always try and help. Um, the main bulk of help probably comes from PFA. So the PFA have got a set up, obviously you pay into that, you're part of it. As soon as you turn pro, you become in the Professional Footballers Association, effectively it's called. Um, and that's like a governing body that will run sort of stuff away from the FA and that's like, it's almost like a wellbeing thing really. Um, but their duty of care is looking after players. So there's a lot of help. There's basically, they come in and do a talk, a couple of talks a year, sit the lads down and they'll sort of run through what can be done. I don't think the lads really understand or know how much is for, available for them to help. So you can be bereavement, um, need to do a new school course, uh, university course. You can do, there's, there's so much stuff, coaching. There's, they basically cover everything. So you just ring the PFA. Yeah. Once you've been in it, you're in it forever. Yeah. They consider you to be like a life member of it effectively, although you don't pay into it, they yeah. will help you. Yeah, that's good. Um, and they, yeah, there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of different places you can go. Obviously gambling's a big one. Mm. They do a lot of that. I know a lot of players. That I've played with have unfortunately fallen foul to that. I've seen Ivan Tony. Yeah, obviously Mental he's been gambling that, himself. Yeah, yeah, doing that as well. So he's obviously, yeah, I don't know. It was never my bag. So I could never sit, understand why it would get to that. But I didn't have that personality. I don't think that would, that would mm. allow me to go that way. Um, but unfortunately, I know a lot of people do have. And I've seen some people get into some real sticky uh, situations. And I played with a lad at Leighton Orient that, um, I only found out after, to be fair, like, because he yeah, now works for it and does, comes down and does talks. Uh, like, of Scotty Davis, he was at Reading, had a good career. Had a, probably should have had a better career, but had a real problem with gambling. Uh, he was at Leighton Orient with me, like, and I'd have never, this is a bit where, like, I sort, you sort of learn it. This is where, like, being a captain, I started trying to look at it slightly different, but I weren't a captain there. I was just one of the lads and just never picked up on it, really. Didn't see that he was struggling. Uh, played with him for a year effectively and then it weren't till after that I realised how what he was going through and he was gambling away within a day or two of him getting paid he's gone he's getting bailed out by his mum and dad no way. so ashamed to tell any of the lads um, sleeping in his car around the corner because he had to lose his place uh, because he couldn't afford to keep it couldn't afford to put enough petrol in his car so he'd park his car close enough to the ground and he'd sleep in his car some nights before training come in train think everything's all right because you hide it mask it and he had some real yeah some real dark times he's come out so the other side of this once that once now. that gambling addiction gets you mm. it's it's horrendous yeah but you probably see it less these days because of um again like you said the sports science and how closely players are monitored but yeah certainly back in the day like alcohol was another thing wasn't it oh, mate, yeah. alcohol was huge yeah. yeah so like yeah it just seems that there's and, and and it might just be one of these things that in in any you know anything in life where you've got enough people you're going to have mm. people that become addicts in, in one way or another but yeah i think it's easy to assume that it's an easy ride but there must be a lot of pressure and i guess as yeah. well when you when you you know sort of grow up thinking about football become a pro player it's very regimented everything's done yeah. and then 20 years on yeah. you're suddenly cut loose and as yeah, you say yeah. you're like fending for yourself maybe for the first time and yeah. as an adult it must be pretty tough it is, it is, I said it is difficult and that's why I said like we go back to that touch on that where like the gambling the drinking for some people with drugs whenever like people get involved with that and things like that it's a, a way of getting away from what's happening mm -hmm. so like the pressures of football some people it affects them even more it affects here everyone. with injuries as well don't you long term injuries they don't know how to cope with a long term injury yeah. boom out on the piss all the time it's like you hear yeah. Kieran Dyer back in the day and stuff yeah. and he talks about it. he got a bad injury yeah. and he was out he said every night of the week. It's mm. It is a, it's an escape me mechanism, isn't it? It's something that like going for a drink, like if you've got mad pressure 
in a week of like you've got a big game or something like that there's there aren't a lot of ways when you sit at home and you think about it the more and more you think that it's, it builds up on you so a way for some lads to get away from that is to go and have a drink mm. and go and try and put it down an injury go and have a drink and trouble is that it ends up going down a slippery slope doesn't it yeah. so it's it's difficult. I said players will try and escape as much as they can because it's just a way of mentally trying to just release a bit of pressure. Like I never like, obviously, you don't don't get told it a lot. You don't get really planned for it. Don't really get taught how to deal with it. You just sort of have to go on your feet and people that can deal with it, deal with it. People that don't, go. And that, that is that just is what it is. Have, like, you, have you seen it ruin football. careers? Yeah, I've seen it ruin careers. I've seen people that just can't function with it really and don't like it. I've seen players play, uh, people retire. And once they retire, they're really happy. Mm. And I'm like I said, like I'm not saying I'm I'm in a hole. Like I'm not not happier. I've got my daughter now. Like I'm 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 happy. Like I said, um, I just missed that side of it because I I did enjoy it as much as it was difficult and it was hard and it wasn't probably what I thought it was when I was a kid. I think the glamours of it as a kid yeah. <laughs> that you see, especially nowadays with yeah. the money involved in yeah. it, you just see the front end though, don't you? Yeah, you see that you see the very high, high, minimal percent. You don't see the level at which, like I functioned, obviously probably more at League One and League Two. Obviously played a bit in the Championship, but like predominantly probably League One. Um, where the money is good money, so you can live good month to month. But if you don't plan for that, you've got a real problem after. Um, and there ain't a lot of help for that. People don't tend to help you with that. That's just something that sort of you're left to your own. Here's your money, and I know it must change at the top level, but then the top level, I suppose, it's that much money that. Doesn't matter. It doesn't, matter. It doesn't yeah. really matter. Yeah, yeah. like it's sort of stratosphere money, the amount they make. But at our level, it's not like, especially League Two level and stuff like that. They, some of them are probably not getting paid. A lot of people would be on a lot better money at their normal jobs. Hence the reason well, what, when you go the, down. What's the, the average wage of the League Two club? I don't even know. I wouldn't I don't know. know. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't probably know. say probably about a thousand pound. I would have thought yeah. a week for a player, maybe yeah. something like that. Well, you can earn. You can get that being a plumber, can you? Yeah, exactly. But then you get the then you get the other side of it. We've seen a couple of lads do this, which they quite like. Is that you go and then get a trade or you go and get a job, and then you go and work. You go and play for a real good semi pro team like a, a Bath. Yeah, we spoke about this. Yeah, on the they thing. might yeah. pay. Yeah, you we know a few lads four, out. five, six hundred quid a game. But you train on Tuesday night, you train on Thursday night, you work for the week. Football's not as important as what it is when you go to this level where like, I mean, to to fans and to the football club, it's, it's do or die, isn't it? Like yeah. uh, This thing. And you speak to so many fans that it is literally their whole life. I mean, I've got a client, and she is, she is honestly, she's argo mad. She yeah. loves, she honestly, she's yeah. like, she she comes in, she'll uh, do her PT sessions. She has green argo socks. She, yeah. she goes to virtually every home away game. She is, yeah, fucking it's, it's big, it's, big it's a lifestyle. Fan. I love be, it. You and know? to be fair, for our fans down here, I would like obviously a lot of the fans I play for at other clubs were very good. Like obviously, I've never really had a problem with fans, but our fans down here, what they have to do and the travelling they have to do, and and it's it's just mad, like. To be fair, sometimes you sit there and you're like, you plan a Saturday and then it'll be a Tuesday night away, but you'd be up like well up north. And, it, and they're there. And, they're there. Yeah. and you're like, fair play. Like, <laughs> yeah. 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 Probably come all the way back, back really late. Back. It's the commitment's huge, like what they get. And they they deserve obviously everything that's happened to them with this year, especially from how bad the club went that one that one time to come well, back nearly, to where it, we are it, now. It nearly went amazing. under, didn't it? The yeah. whole club, yeah. Under. She had all that greatness. The championship was great. Obviously, really good. And then the real fall from grace. And we were lucky. We didn't. We didn't lose the football club. Yeah. And now we sit here now and they're back in the championship. And all them years of hard work and sacrifice that everyone's done to get them back there. It's it's amazing, really. And the club deserve it. The club deserve it. Yeah, it's brilliant. So we don't really have many kids watching this, but we might have some parents. who might show their kids. If you've got any any young lads, lucky enough, you know, girls these days, looking to you know aspiring to be footballers, what advice would you give to, I guess, to to kids trying to be footballers, but also parents trying to support kids being footballers? Yeah, for the parents, I'd just say I think as simple as like just allow them to enjoy it, allow them to find their feet. I was never pushed by my dad to be a footballer. My dad would have loved me to be a footballer. Um, he loved football himself, but he was never. If I didn't want to play football, I didn't have to play football. I did it because I loved it. He took me everywhere. I was really lucky. So he gave me the opportunity and without him doing that, I would have never obviously got it. So I wanted to repay him. That's why I worked hard and things like that. But he didn't. He never put a pressure on me. My mum and dad never put a pressure on me. I did it because I love to do it. They like watching it thing. But it was never like, it was never that pressure comes and the pressure of football, if you really do get to the levels that you want to and you want to go pro level, the pressure comes like, so spend as much of your life without it 
you've got to learn to deal with it to a certain degree. But I see a lot of kids get pushed a lot now. And it looks as though, and this is horrible, but sometimes it can be the dream of the dad more than the kid. And I've seen it happen to someone that was quite, not quite close to me, but someone that was like I knew growing up as a kid. Um, he was fortunate enough to get into an academy when he was quite young. It wasn't his dream, really. He went in really young, a lot younger than I did. And by the time he got to the age that I went in, he was just it was just out of him. He just completely lost the love of it and just and he, he quit. And he was a good player yeah. and he quit, but it come through. And that was difficult then between him and his family because they didn't agree with the decision. He didn't want to do it. And life's too short to like thing. You do let your kids do what they enjoy doing like, and, and, and back them to do whatever they want to do. Like it's, it's, it's just a, football's amazing. And I would, obviously I've got a daughter now. I'd love her to go and play pro football. Like I'd, I'd absolutely love that. But if she turns around to me at any point in her life and says, I don't want to do it, I'll back her to do whatever she wants to do. Like I just want to be happy. Like that's all. And, send, and kids playing for me personally the biggest thing for me was hard work I think that was a massive thing and, and believe just believe in yourself like have a real self belief that it is achievable I got told a lot more times that I wouldn't make it and, I, and ones that are, like I could probably count them on one hand people that actually probably maybe believe that I might make it I was constantly told that you're not good enough for this you won't be quick enough you don't live in the right area you'll never get picked up that all the way through your career like really yeah. but I always I always believed that I could be a footballer. I always believed that like when the chance come around, that if I'd worked hard enough and give myself the best opportunity, then I could take that chance. Um, and that was, yeah, self-belief. Self-belief and enjoying it. I enjoyed doing it. That's why I did it. Like, And that's why I wanted to work hard and that's why I wanted to try and make it into a career because I genuinely enjoyed it. I loved doing yeah. it. And I didn't do it because my dad wanted me to do it. I didn't do it because my mates were doing it. I did that because I wanted to do it. Like, And if I didn't want to do it, I would have walked away from it. Class. Yeah, I think hard work's so much easier when you're passionate, right? Oh, man, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, if you enjoy football, it's, it's the easiest thing in the world, yeah. isn't it, really? Yeah. It's so awesome. passionate and wanting to do stuff and yeah. you can achieve anything you want to do for the kids out there now, like, it's, yeah, I aim to be, I said, my aim was to play for England, play in the Premier League. I never did it, I said, but I always, I always tried to aim for that. But then my falling short of that was, I played in the Championship, I played 500 games as a pro and had a good 18 year career, so, it weren't a bad second play. <laughs> before wrong. before we wrap it up, best story you got football? Best story I've got. I'll be honest, I've got loads. Some that I probably couldn't share. <laughs> Played with some absolute like lunatics uh, through the years. Jamie Mackey probably being one of the main ones. Really? A lot of his stories. You yeah, couldn't I, share? I, I don't think I'd share. <laughs> um, got a good one with like a lad called like really well known, uh, well known, so Cherno Samba. Yeah, I don't remember. So you talk Sambo. about banter and stuff like this. So Chono Samba like, was obviously he's at Millwall, been linked with like moves to Liverpool, whatever, when he was young, million yeah. pound, whatever. So he come into he come into Plymouth, didn't he? I remember. Yeah. But he weren't all there, like really. He was a bit like slow with it. He was a bit one of them like where <laughs> you could have him off a little bit. He probably wouldn't know you're getting him like and things like that. And we had like people <laughs> involved, like older lads in the dressing room that was like the banter side of it and yeah. they're like, do you know what I mean? He was younger, or the same age as me. We had a we had a physio at the time called Paul Maxwell. Maxie's like, love him, like, real good friend of mine, like, but just, he's clever, like, and he's quick. So he knew when, like, to have people on, did everything right when he was meant to do it, did everything right. So we're training one day, and, like, um, Churns gets, like, knocked. I can't remember if he got, I can't remember if he got the ball in his face or he got a little elbow or something yeah. like that, but he rocked his jaw a little bit. <laughs> so he's complaining about his jaw for the rest of training. Comes up, obviously, we're all getting showered, changed, whatever, like, going to go for food. We all have, like, big green room where we used to all, all eat. And, uh, so yeah, he'd gone into Maxi and gone like, ah, oh, like um, my jaw's killing me. Like I said, like, can you have a look at it? But he was seeing, I think he was seeing what, I think it was Watsy at the time. Watsy was in the injury room with him. Maxi was one of them quite ruthless, just tell you to fuck off out. If it, like, do you know what I mean? He had no time for anyone. If you weren't injured, he fucking tell you, you ain't injured. And, but Churns, you could get on him a little bit. And Maxi was all about banter and like funny for the lad. So he sent Churns away. So look, come back in 10 minutes. So he, he obviously fucks off out. And then I think like between Watsy and Maxi, <laughs> And then Churns has he called Churns back in like 10 minutes later and he's gone like, come on, let's have a look at your lad. And he's a bit dopey, Churns. Won't really get that he's being had off. And like Max, he's having a look at him, looking at his chin and stuff like that. And he's gone, oh my God, lad. He said like, we need to do something about this. And Churns has gone like, what, what's the matter? Like, I thought something was wrong. He said like, you've got um, drop jaw syndrome. <laughs> 
And so like Watsy's like, Watsy tells a story about it because he was sat on the bed with him and like all of us were eating at this time. So like, and Watsy's like, he said like, so Maxie's like going, yeah, like he said, if we, unless we treat this now, like, he said like, this, is, this could be serious, but if we treat it now, it should be all right, but it's quite serious. So Churn's like, all right, Sam, he said, so right, so he tells Churn's like, right, let me just get some tape in that here. So he's gone into his medical thing. He's got out one of these like, you know, the bandages you get yeah. at like, at like hospital and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's meat as long. It's meat as long. This thing. He's pulled out the whole ravel, like, and he's gone like turns. Hold that bit under your chin there. So he's got in a thing. He's wrapped this bandage <laughs> round his head. Honestly, I swear down about two hundred times. This bandage <laughs> looks like he's got like fence. <laughs> it's like all round his head here, like this. Taped it all round as well. Right. Turns could hardly see out of it by the end. Of it. He's got this massive thing. And he's gone, right, you'd be all right. I've like, got to leave it on for a couple of hours. Though. So Chan's like, right, sound. He went, go down and get your lunch. <laughs> so oh, so he's what? come down, honestly, like, <laughs> uh, we're, everyone's eating. I've, like, spat my food out. I'm, like, fucking <laughs> screaming, like, laughing. Yeah. I'm, like, what the fuck are you doing, Chan's? <laughs> and he come back in, still didn't know it was a joke. And he's like, oh, no, I've got a uh, drop joint. <laughs> and all the boys are looking at each other, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> And with that, like, obviously, Max has come down and, like, he's he's carried on playing oh, it. He's carried on playing the game a bit. <laughs> Churn just kept it on for, must have been fucking boiling. Must have kept it on for probably another fucking hour until Max, he's, like, broke down and all the boys are, like, fucking jumping on each other. No way. He was just one of those kids that you could just, like, you tell him saying he believes it. <laughs> and he's, he's got him with that. Honestly, the bandage, I've, got, I've pictured that in my head, like, it's just, the bandage was fucking massive. And if it was someone else, if he'd done that to me, I'd be, like, looking in the mirror again. Yeah, fuck off, Max. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. fuck off, lad. There's no way this is real. And he was just, he was just, just one of them kids. But there's, like, I could tell you a million of stories like that, mate. Football's just built on yeah. the lads yeah, fucking about. Yeah, but brilliant. there are some that, like, yeah, happen away from football that's, I could tell you off air, but like, yeah, on air, yeah, like they're a yeah. bit, yeah, yeah. a bit of one of them ones. But uh, you meet you meet characters from every walk of life, don't you? In football, yeah, of course you do, mate. And it's just like some of the maddest ones I've I've worked with are are the funniest ones. Class, mate. Yeah, no. mate, fucking love it, mate. Really appreciate you coming on, mate. It's been no, an absolute no pleasure. Legend. Cheers, buddy, Thanks, mate. No worries. Cheers, Thank guy. you. Thank you.